Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome. I hope you can all uh, hear us. Uh, it's a line that everybody uses, but I genuinely hope it's the case. Um, welcome, um, first of all, to, to everybody, and I um, hope that you and yours are all safe and well um, in what are obviously these crazy times. Um, obviously, six weeks ago, I think we're all living in a, a certain uh, ignorant bliss about what was about to happen in, in the marketplace, the world that we knew. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, what started a social economic, or sorry, a social and healthcare has impacted far deeper and wider than that. We've obviously got an economic um, issue at the moment in the business world, but more emotionally, we're all affected by this and we're all going through a change curve that we didn't realize was on the horizon. Uh, many of us, I think as you will agree, are busier than ever. Our priorities may have changed, um, but in that sense, we've gone from running business plans to now having to do with uh, business as usual, operational management of the, our entities and our organizations, changing work patterns, changing customer demands. Um, rarely, I would say, have the economic principles of supply and demand ever been more tested. Um, many of us organizations have obviously seen business usage, business demand drop in ma in enormously in the last few weeks. Um, whether you ma use massive price reductions, that's not influencing it. These are on very interesting times that economics is struggling to adapt to, and as it's understandable that we've, we're struggling to adapt to as well. Um, I think the outcome, um, obviously many people are facing at the moment, is to re reduce costs, review supply chain, review people, um, review their, the route to the market, their businesses, and even the business principles that only six weeks ago were just normal business um, and business as usual. I think it's, un it's fair to say, and we should all accept it, that these changes, the economic changes, are really hard for all of us. Um, I think it's fair to say that business leaders have more questions than answers at the moment. It doesn't matter whether you're the top of the tree or whether you've got a department to lead or whatever your, your colleagues are thinking, we all have to lead at some point. And this is more, uh, well, it's more obvious in our actions now than ever before. Um, I think we're all under pressure to make decisions, but we have to remain long-sighted, I think is the right phrase to use. We have to see that there is a horizon. We have to think that we're going to go over the peak of COVID at some point, and then there is going to be view on the other side. We've got to think that while we're tackling it ourselves, we need to take our team with us, and we have to deal with the issues of management. We can't avoid them. Um, Yes, there are sectors that are experiencing um, stronger demand than others. We've, I'm sure we've all heard it on the news and the press, whether it be pharmaceuticals, uh, medical technologies, uh, telecoms, some of the education, learning platforms uh, online are changing dramatically at the moment. So it, this is something that, whilst the majority affected, um, it really is about the sector that you're in and how you were able to cope and deal with it. Um, I think we're all hoping for a V-shaped uh, pickup. Uh, when that will come uh, is, a, is a, a crystal ball question, I guess. It's what we hope will happen. Let's say some of the uh, social um, distancing is released and relaxed by July. What will that mean to us? What will the new world look like? I think we also have to reference the fact that I think we're going to have to prepare ourselves for the fact that um, this will be a lockdown long, in many ways, longer than we've ever known. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you look at the German government, I saw last, was it yesterday or the day before, they actually cancelled Oktoberfest because of the social responsibility and the fact there should be no public gatherings. They're looking at October. Uh, we need to see that as potentially on our horizon, that we're looking into the autumn before there is a, a and past the autumn before there's a normality movement in the again. It's just the reality of what we're seeing. We've got to accept that without a vaccination, we have a public responsibility to manage health in the UK um, and obviously anywhere else in the world. Um, but without that vaccination, we're going to be living with coronavirus. And that means living carefully. And also that means living remotely, perhaps. It means living in a, uh, and with different communication techniques. But equally, uh, the business agendas will still maintain. We will have expectations of what a good business looks like and how we can improve things. So whilst we deal with the impact in the first few weeks, we then have to get to business as usual, and then we have to get new business plans to move forward. And so, you know, whilst we've all felt the shock of COVID, we're now living through what I would say is the aftershock, the ripples, the, 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 what difference does that mean? What does a new world look like? So we've got to take that responsibility on ourselves. 
Um, personally, with Savants, um, four years ago, um, we were literally four years old in January. You know, um, all great plans, five-year business plans and all that sort of thing. Wow, what an impact that's happened in the last six weeks. We've had to deal with the speed of it, uh, of the COVID impact, the cultural changes. We're all working from home for obviously. How we communicate with each other. Um, we've obviously accelerated and adopted a greater use of technology um, and had to also understand that many of our clients stopped recruiting or changed recruitment techniques and what they're looking for at this point in time. But because we're quite a, a mature consultant experience in the business, that we're able to consult and help people through that change period. Um, you know, so all I'm saying is that as a business, we, everyone's going through it together. We reflect the challenges that I'm sure many of you face. And yeah, and we are looking to adapt new techniques, uh, adopt a new strategies here and there. You know, we've chosen as a business to maintain our structure uh, and keep people employed and engaged, um, where many of our competitors have um, working now with skeleton staff. We think if we invest in the market, we can get some opportunity to work and get better, closer relationships with our customers. But equally, I think that's a lot of this is about the team and the people we've got in the team and their mental health, our opportunity, how we work together and the confidence that they give us as a business. And I'm sure that's some of the things that you see in your own organizations. So really, this leads me into leading through change and obviously the topic for today. Um, most importantly, We've got to lead our colleagues and our teams through change. Um, here we are logging to webinar from 100 different locations in the UK and around the world. So just to recap, we're going to focus today on motivating and coordinating teams remotely, leading through change and uncertainty, uh, remote decision making and communication techniques. Techniques. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Zoe Williams uh, from Lifestyle Coaching. Zoe, Simply has had a very successful corporate career across multiple sectors, leading to FTSE 250 audit teams, um, and then before more recently moving into professional coaching, and today works with some of the world's business leaders to develop and deliver both their own personal goals and their business goals. So quite a combination. Um, for the format of the webinar, we're going to break this down into those four topics. We plan to spend approximately 10 minutes on each of those areas, broken down by uh, reviewing a, a presentation from Zoe and, and then a brief question and answer session after every one of those slides and presentations. So feel free and I invite you to send questions during the webinar. Um, I'm very confident we should be able to give you some guidance, if not give you the answers, but um, certainly it's a formative environment. So we learn from the questions. I'm sure many of you have got uh, um, things that may affect you in your own organizations. Um, obviously, uh, Chatham House rules exist here, but obviously I think there's many concepts that you'd like to discuss and please feel free to ask the questions. So um, on that basis, I'll introduce you and hand over to Zoe. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody from um, all four corners of the world. I'm currently in Sydney, so it's a real pleasure to be presenting with you this morning where you are, this evening where I am. Um, just want to say, start by saying thank you so much for coming. I know time is precious at the moment, so I really hope that you um, get a lot of value out of the next 50 minutes with us. As Mark said, I'm going to move through the different four agenda items and you should have a questions box. You should be able to see a questions box on your screen. As I'm moving through the content, if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in there. Mark's going to monitor it. And at the end of each agenda item, we're going to look in the questions box and answer as many of those as we can. Um, it's a time of... It, incredible uncertainty none of us have ever been in this position before but it's also a, a time of opportunity as well and a lot of the clients that I'm currently working with um, are seeing it as an opportunity but also seeing it as a time to really focus on how to support their team so hopefully what you take away today is going to help you do that. Um, I just want to start by talking about change and the change curve that most of you will be um, familiar with. So we've we've got this change curve going on, and like Mark mentioned, it's it's an at an accelerated pace. So we're all going through change much faster than we have um, ever experienced before, and we're all going to be on that change curve at different points on the change curve individually. Um, collectively, so your teams will be at different points on the change curve, and then your organization will be at a different point on the change curve. We've even got countries clearly on at different points on that curve, so it's happening globally. And this is a really important diagram and concept to um, hold in the forefront of your mind at the moment, because this is going to be your anchor 
to decide how to lead your teams through the change and how to appropriately adapt your leadership depending on where they are on this change curve. So if you look at the diagram on your screen, you can see that most of us are probably on the downward slope, if not at the bottom, where a lot of individuals and teams can be feeling angry, they can be feeling frustrated, they can be feeling confused. So there's quite a lot of negative emotion going on globally, but certainly um, in England at the moment from the clients that I've spoken to. And as leaders, you really need to be able to um, spot that, um, hear it, feel it and see it and, and respond to it accordingly. So um, there's no shortcuts, unfortunately. Changes, it changes change and you can you can make the, dip, the, the downward dip and you can level it off faster, but you can't avoid it. There always is a dip um, when it comes to change. And unfortunately, people can get stuck. So from an emotional intelligence perspective, individuals often find themselves stuck in the dip and they may come out of it but there's there's remnants of the dip that are left in their in their memory bank and they will take that forward into the cultural fabric of your organization if that um experience has isn't processed for them so it's really important as leaders that you try and spot where people may be stuck um, in fear or in anxiety. A lot of the organizations that I work with, where I work with big leadership teams of 50, 60, 70 people, the reason they're not performing is because something happened many years ago that a lot of them haven't forgotten and they're carrying the war wounds of that experience. So this is that type of incident. It's normally um, something to do with a health and safety incident or you know, it's usually a big incident. This is that type of incident where as leaders, we need to be very sensitive to the fact that people may find themselves stuck at the bottom of that dip. So you need to know how to move your organisations through this and look to the future. So that's what I'm hopefully going to um, provide you with today. So the first agenda item that I'd like to talk to you about is communication and emotional intelligence. And it's just to move on from that um, change curve and talk about how people listen. Because often as leaders, we think when we're communicating, it's what we're saying that's the most important, but actually, it's how that information is being received and depending on where your teams are on this curve will depend on how they're receiving the information that you're, you're sharing with them. So it's really, really important that as a leader, you um, listen out for where are they on the change curve and how is that going to influence their listening. At the moment, people are listening through the filter of fear, anxiety and uncertainty. And that's a, a very primal place to be. Survival is very primal. It's amygdala at the back of our brain is being fired. The nervous system is heightened. So they'll be listening for and um, in, listening for is my job at risk or listening for is the company going to survive or they'll be listening for danger they'll be listening for signs of uncertainty and that's that's not that's a subconscious process that's going on so as leaders it's really important that you um adapt your communication so that you can reassure those that are feeling anxious so anybody that's anxious wants to be reassured anyone that's afraid um wants to know more facts um, people who are in uncertainty, they want to know about the future, so they want you to present them with a vision for the future to, to calm that anxiety down. So how are your teams listening? Where are they on this curve and how will that be affecting the filters that they're receiving your information through? Now, the next thing that I want to share with you is about integrity. So leaders, to become a leader, you have to have enormous amounts of integrity and you will know that you're under the microscope with your teams normally anyway, much as we don't like it. Um, so they're watching us and they're listening to us. And at the moment, they're really watching us and really listening to us. So it's really important that you have um, integrity around what you say and what you're doing. Um, does your behavior line up with what you're saying? Or if you're asking people to be calm and um, collected, are you being calm and collected at the same time? So it's really important to maintain your integrity they're going to be looking for signs of danger so the the best that you can do at reassuring your teams um the better adapt your communication to the listening filters and also don't over identify with what's happening so we tend to have a tendency um when things when we're in crisis to over make it mean something about us over identify with it it's really important that you try not to do that um that can again have your teams feel more insecure because they they might feel that you're thinking about yourself rather than them and then the trust gets um, diminished and eroded so 
as a recap on communication, it's really important that you maintain your integrity. It's really important that to reassure people there's still a vision for the future. And you do have to be you do have to be real about it. You know, obviously we don't know what the future holds, but to have some kind of vision and some kind of commitment to making sure that the organization comes out of this um the best way that they can and you really need to tap into how your teams are listening to you and where they are on that curve and you might have individuals who are a bit more resilient so this is about emotional resilience and if you've got people in your teams who are further ahead on the curve than others how can you encourage them to support the ones who maybe are struggling so you definitely don't want people to get stuck in COVID-19 sort of terror as I'm calling it with my clients um, Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Do you want to build or are there any questions that have come in? Well, I was going to say, um, certainly a couple of comments there. I think the point about denial, I think people going through that change curve can be in denial about what's happening around them and want to hold on, yeah, understandably, to what was only a short period of time ago, the, the norm, um, on the hope that it's, we're going to go back to that. But I'm, I think on the horizon is that we're not going to be the same. We're going to change and we have to work a way to adapt to that change and adopt it. Yeah. Um, and I think the other point I'd make would be that on that change curve, um, people can move along it and back, forward and backwards on it, depending on the circumstances and what happens. It's not one case of, OK, it, we've got that piece of change in. Every time you do some change, you're going to people are going to go back on that curve again and you're going to have to almost replot where they are on that journey to accepting it. Um, and I think that's really important because people will move back, you know, will, may accept some parts of it, doesn't affect them that much, but another thing really affects them very much very well a greater extent personally yeah and uh, we haven't got any particular questions at the moment so um unless there's any other comments do you want to move on to the next topic or the next mm -hmm. area next Everyone agenda must be all their questions at the end it just makes perfect sense right <laughs> if, there, if there are any questions please send them through because um yeah be happy to answer them so decision making so after communication you've got decision making emotions drive decision making again this is why emotional intelligence is so important um leaders who have well developed emotional intelligence are absolutely phenomenal at helping their teams make decisions and in crisis it's all about the emotions so following the theme of where are your teams on that change curve if they've got fears if they've got concerns they will undoubtedly have a desire to do the right thing and that might slow things down people might be more hesitant to make decisions right now they might be feeling more anxious about making decisions they might be looking to you the leader to be providing more of the answers and that's going to be putting a, a, an immense burden on you because um, you're going to have to be involved in many many more things so how can we help our teams feel safer to make decisions well a lot of it is about reality testing so at the moment we haven't got that certainty that we're used to we haven't got like mark said that five-year plan to rely on and say oh well you know i know what's going to be happening in the next quarter or i i hope to know what's going to be happening we just don't know so we need to ground our teams in the now and what's happening right now and encourage them to make more frequent decisions encourage them to reality test much more frequently and do it together as well in groups in clusters to try and alleviate you um, from some of that leadership pressure that i know is going on at the moment leaders are finding it a huge burden and it's and it's and it's understandable you know you have to apply empathy to this situation people are afraid of, of doing the wrong thing so what does reality testing look like it's it's an element of emotional intelligence and it's the ability to really stop your thoughts now our thoughts have a very annoying tendency to get carried away, don't they? They get carried away into the future and something happens and then we try and kind of predict or forecast what's gonna happen, but we also make a lot of assumptions and judgments. So on the one hand, you've got what's actually happened. And then on the other hand, you've got all of these additional judgments and perceptions and assumptions that we add on top of it. So it's a real art to, to recognize when your thoughts are getting carried away and stop them, pull yourself back and say, okay, actually, what is happening? What are the facts that we have today that we can make a decision based on today because we actually don't know what's gonna happen next week, next month? As, as Mark said, this we just don't know how long this is gonna go on for. And I think part of this um, new way of decision-making should form part of your new normal. And again, to, to sort of build on what Mark said, there are lots of people still using the language when we get back to normal. And I think it's really important that leaders try and 
shift that dialogue away from getting back to any kind of normal and creating a new normal because I don't honestly believe that there'll be a normal to go back to it's just what can we create new and how can we make sure that our businesses are still able to succeed and thrive in this new way of working should it go on for you know years um goodness hopes not but it, you know it might be the case so reality testing and creating a new normal is really important um, another thing to consider is when we're in survival mode, which a lot of our teams are, that amygdala that I mentioned, that part of their brain, which is about survival and fight or flight, will be increasing people's impulse, impulsivity. And emotional intelligence has impulse control as a subscale. Some people who have better Im impulse control, so those more steady eddies, those ones that you know take their time making decisions, are probably the ones that you want to call on the most in your teams at the moment to help the others who are maybe the bigger risk takers, the more the ones that in a growth organization you really want around you because they're the ones that can make the decisions quickly. But right now you want people who are going to reality test and ground themselves and those around them in what's actually going on today. Um, this is going to be a new way of doing things for a lot of teams because they're not going to be used to having to make decisions, new decisions, new decisions as new information comes in. It takes a lot of emotional intelligence, it takes a lot, a lot of energy as well that's why I'm suggesting you put people in groups so that they can support each other and again try and alleviate some of the pressure on you as leaders to be driving this reality testing top down. Mark any builds on that? Yeah I can, I can give you some experiences of our own business uh, which is just very simple ones I mean I'm sure many of you found the same but that first three weeks three or four weeks leading up to Easter um, my phone was hot I'd never used my mobile phone as much um, internally we were all talking to each other this is the right decision what do we do in this situation we're trying to reassure each other that that was the case um, because in many ways uh, do the leaders in the business know any better than anybody else in that situation it's a changing world but we all look for that reassurance so I literally when it came to Easter I was very happy almost to hide my phone for four days and, and run away from it uh, but it was good I mean, and I think it, it proved the fact that we can communicate which you have to do but um, Going back to your point about language, I think um, we started our own sort of, we use Google Hangouts, but in the uh, on the mornings to discuss you know business issues, what the plan was for the day when we first went into remote working. And we titled the Hangouts, you know, COVID-19 Hangout. After a couple of weeks, we suddenly realized that this is ridiculous because this is the new norm. So it's now just business as usual. We titled it business as usual just to change the concept for people to understand this is what we've got to do. This is the new norm. Um, subtle things, but it makes that way. Uh, and finally, your uh, t your point about groups, um, rather than thinking all communication or all, t all messaging and decisions has to come from one point, um, we're already set up in teams, the three teams within the business, a London mm -hmm. finance team, Reading finance or Thames Valley finance, and then a technology team. And very much we worked out that we reduced the number of central calls where everybody was on it and had it um, daily hangouts with the, the small teams and they were a lot more productive than trying to get everybody onto thinking we have to include everybody. The teams are a lot better decision making in their environment and knowing knowing what the market's doing rather than making general statements. So I think very much it's about localizing that that discussion and teams. It is. And were they used to they were used to doing that already, were they Mark? Um, yes they were, but I think it almost got thrown away in the first few weeks of COVID. Um, and I think in that sense, you know, it uh, was something that we, we didn't mean to, to disrupt, but it was one of those things that I think we thought we all had, we're all in it together, we'll do everything together. But then you realize the nuances of different teams, different markets, different personal situations, you know, they'll yeah. better tackle smaller meetings. Yeah. Um, we, we've got, we've got a, a question here. I'm just going to read through it. Um, okay. Working as part of an agile project team, I find that there is a level daily communications that regularly enables the team members to voice concerns and thereby provides the opportunity for the team to be understanding of the members issues um, both work and in their home lives totally agree mm -hmm. um, do you have a view on how tight teams provide this self-governance how tight teams provide this self-governance well I think it that's why I've mentioned it two or three times and project teams are much more used to doing this aren't they with their with their methodology but I think it's really important and I was going to come on to it in the remote working so we'll just talk about it now leaders really need to let go and they really need to empower their teams and that's a really great example of how empowering your teams to self-lead 
can really make a difference because they do need to be talking daily on a regular basis because if you think about what we what we were all doing six months ago most of us were either in an office or if we weren't in an office we were working with customers clients we were doing a lot of face-to-face -face interacting and that's all gone and it's not the same on a screen i mean i i I'm, I'm getting used to this but it's not the same is it from an emotional intelligence perspective you can't really feel the other person you can't really read them as well as you you can face to face so it's really important that those communication touch points are encouraged and set up and enabled so, um, who was that comment from, Mark? Who was that question from? I don't know. It's an oh. honor. all anonymous. 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 Whoever that was, brilliant, great. Encourage it outside of your project teams as well, if you can, and encourage it across the business. Because when we come on to remote working, the next agenda item, I'm going to talk about what pe how people's behavior has actually shifted. And as leaders, we need to do something about it to encourage what you've just said works, which is these huddles, these groups. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Any other questions on decision making? Raise your hand. <laughs> Not like being in a room with people, is it? It's funny. <laughs> okay, let's we'll move on to the next topic then. Right, this remote working. Um, so I notice I haven't language is really important. I haven't used coronavirus or COVID-19 or anything in this presentation because I think this is really about just creating a new normal. It's you know, we're not it, it, it's not going to go away quickly. So the language and the dialogue that we use is really, really relevant. So remote working. People are working more so much more. All my clients, all of their teams, all of my friends and all of my family are telling me that their diary is now more full with meetings than it ever has been. And people are working more hours. Now, this just doesn't make sense from a well-being perspective. And it doesn't make sense from a, if we look at that curve again, it's, it doesn't make sense to help people come out of the dip. It's gonna drive, it's gonna, this is one of the things that is gonna make your um, low point in the dip lower, for sure. So I think what's going on after I've asked a few few people and, and spoken with a few teams of my clients, I think what's going on is there's a number of things, but the anxiety that people are feeling and the fear that they're feeling around their job security is meaning that people are um, feeling like they should be showing up more, they should be more visible. So if their diary is full or if they're on video calls or if they're attending more meetings, it's kind of reassuring themselves that they're, you know, I'm visible and I'm seen. So if your teams are doing that, please, 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 encourage them to know that they are being tr they're trusted they're trusted to deliver what they need to deliver and they don't need to feel anxious about visibility um we'll come on to that a bit more later but the other reasons that i think people are doing this i think it's also um that lack of connection so people are feeling you know at home in their home office like I've, you know i've got here it's an empty room so there's that need and that desire to connect with people still which they're not getting they're not getting the water cooler conversations they're not getting the the coffee break you know mid-morning to go and have a chat with their colleagues so there's two things going on here and it's and it's mostly driven from human you know behavioral needs it's fear or it's a need to connect now this is not going to work for organizations at all because what we've also got on top of that is most people who have children have got those children at home with them most people who have children and work would normally have support from say grandparents or um brothers and sisters which they can't receive now because we're all um in lockdown so we've got this added pressure where people have got their children at home or if they're single they're on their own and isolated um, so there's all of this going on, which means remote working as leaders, we have to be really, really um, concerned about employee well-being. And it must be if it's not in your top three priorities at the moment, please, please put it in your top three, because how people come out of this change curve is going to depend on how they've been helped and supported through this time. So despite our instinct signaling us to do the opposite because um you know historically leadership style it is traditionally hub and spoke where we, we like to control things and we like to have a lot of visibility i can't say enough trust trust and trust some more now is the time to trust your teams and now is the time to um show them that they are trusted and they are valued by saying to them look we're going to put some boundaries in place so remote working boundaries really really important and this goes back to slide one where i said about integrity so if you're asking your teams to have boundaries in place around their working hours please honor these boundaries yourself as well as a leader you must show up doing what you're asking your teams to do and there's a degree there's an opportunity here so 
there's an opportunity to be really flexible there's an opportunity to be innovative I know one of my clients they're getting up early before the kids get up and they're doing a couple of hours of work and they're even having calls with their team so they've all agreed as a team right we're going to get up at six and we're going to do a couple of hours and then we're going to you know get the kids up get them ready for their homeschooling and have breakfast and then we're going to come back online at nine or 9 30 and they're making their working patterns work for them at home as well so try and be innovative try and ask your teams what's working what's not working and if you notice that somebody is online a lot attending a lot of meetings just have a little one one-on-one -on -one with them and ask them you know what's going on do you really need to attend all of these and who's looking after your kids and are you getting any downtime because a lot of people are working 12 hour days now it's so easy because they're at home to just be logged on and just be going back and forward to their computer to their machine and it really isn't sustainable um going back to the group um support theory have people hold each other accountable so again i can't encourage you enough as leaders to have people supporting each other in small huddles um three or four people maximum so that they can really feel safe to express what's going on for them really share um both personal and professional concerns and fears and have people help each other through that change curve um like i said maintain your integrity and then this reality testing has to come in so reality test the working routine and decision making check on a regular basis is this working what's happening what can i see and what are my team experiencing um you've really got to empower them like now is the time to empower people and i don't know if anybody's seen this but if you haven't please look it up so um i've got to look up his name kevin johnson the starbucks ceo sent an open letter to his employees recently and it was it's just I, I personally think it's a really great approach so he has said look i don't know when to open stores i don't know what order to open them in and i don't know how to reopen the stores he's empowered people at a local level so the store managers to make that decision based on interactions with their local councils and interactions with their customers to decide how to open and when to open so he's basically empowered his entire workforce to pull the entire organization out of this change curve now that that is just inspired and so emotionally intelligent because he's had to let go it's a it's a risky thing to do i mean they they must be putting controls in place to monitor it but at the same time the people who are running those businesses must feel incredibly optimistic and empowered about the future that they are now in charge of and in control of so they're being told that you're actually responsible for your own future so remote working now is a completely different um scenario and i would really encourage you to trust your teams empower them but have clear boundaries set so that you don't have a well-being issue in a couple of months which is is undoubtedly going to happen for many organizations anything to build mark a couple of comments that i um yeah i think your point about structure and boundaries is really important because um <clears throat> it's very easy to respond to things we during the day and not actually achieve what you need to achieve and i think that's getting a regular work pattern again together um, yeah. and i think part of organize you know work, as i mentioned earlier maybe working in teams and things like that gives you some structure to that day and having a certain things where you know you're going to your colleagues are going to be working at the same time as yourself um there's definitely some flexibility with hours um i know again um, a number of our team in Savant, you know, have young families. There's now two parents working from home at the same time, so they're going to have to do a certain amount of sharing and load management on that basis. So, being, offering that flexibility and understanding that. Also, I think um, home working environments are really. You mentioned obviously <clears throat> your, the room you're working from there. The same here for me. I'm lucky to have this facility. Many people don't. Um, so, I think it's really important to try and create. At a time when you can have, you know, you create an environment in the house, the home, whatever the scenario is, uh, to it to support that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's something that's really, really critical to be able to clear. It's not possible sometimes to unclutter the space, but to make it an environment while you're working in it that feels like an office and a work environment or a, a, a quiet environment. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point, actually, because the, the boundaries thing isn't just around between sort of employer and employee. I think we need to encourage our employees to have um, boundaries at home as well. Um, you know, especially if there's two people working in the same in the same home and how how does that how is that coordinated with the, the family dynamic? And, you know, because there's a lot of relationships that will be under strain at the moment as well, not just in the workplace, but also um, people having to share that that additional responsibility at home so there'll be a lot there'll be a lot going on for people that maybe isn't being spoken about 
and it's um, really important that lead don't don't get nosy obviously if people don't want to talk about it they won't but just inquire there's a way to inquire around these things that makes people feel safe to share and uh, maybe people are just a little bit afraid to ask for flexibility you never know they might think you know if i ask for flexibility am i possibly gonna you know be at risk of losing my job because there are a lot of people that are scared about losing their jobs at the moment yeah absolutely there are um i think we'll um, there aren't any other questions at the moment that I can see. Um, is there anything from your end there? I can't. See, you can see anything there? No, no. So we'll plow on. Yep. Okay. Cool. So the final piece of the agenda. So leading through uncertainty. So. Um, as I mentioned at the start, so emotional intelligence is my thing, and I think it's the thing that's going to get the world through this now. I would, wouldn't I? Because I'm an emotional intelligence coach, so that's my uh, <laughs> that's sort of my position. But um, it's you know, uncertainty. Dealing with uncertainty is an emotional thing. It's about uh, the un the un what we don't know, and it, IQ is very much about what we do know. So IQ in, uh, is logic, it's rationale, it's about making decisions based on past data, it's about being able to predict things, and it's about being able to learn and uh, process information. But e emotional intelligence or EQ is very much about being able to read yourself, manage yourself from an emotional perspective, and then manage other people. And when we're in, um, people all over the world are now calling it this VUCA world that we've been in for ages, this volatile and uncertain. Um, environment but it's a, people behave and react differently when uncertainty is around them and because we're all individuals and there's seven billion different people on the planet we can't off we often can't design a way to manage crisis that's going to be fit for purpose for everybody because everybody's going to be feeling differently about it so how it almost feels like an impossible task doesn't it okay well how do i lead you know if some people have got hundreds of people beneath them how do i lead a couple of hundred people all experiencing a different change curve all listening through different filters um, and all responding to what i'm saying in a different way and again it goes back to providing them with that space to talk to each other and providing them with that space to actually clear what it is that they've got on their plate from an emotional perspective and from a practical perspective and they're not always going to want to share that with their with their leadership um, member and they're not always going to want to share it with their with their peers either so it's about providing as many different options as possible not shoehorning them into one you know you've got one chance a week to air what's going on and then that's it you've got to provide people with a variety of options to be able to process this so that it suits as many different people as possible even if you just look at the difference between the differences between introverts and extra, extroverts i'm an extroverted thinker so anything that i've got on my mind i'll want to talk it through so, so that i can process it and move through it an introverted thinker absolutely doesn't want to do that they want to be left alone they want to gather their thoughts on their own and then they'll communicate it once they're ready so you've got to make sure that you can adapt these different um available options to the different types of people that you've got in your teams um i think another another really important thing oh going back to that is so it's about that change curve sorry it's about acknowledging where your teams are and i can't stress that how important this is verbally not just acknowledging it in your own mind but verbally communicating through your communication how you're acknowledging where your teams are and that shows empathy and it shows that you're seeing and hearing them and they'll feel reassured by that and they'll feel validated so it's really important that you acknowledge where your teams are on this curve and encourage them to talk about it because like I said, not everybody will be on, on, at the same point. And then it's really important to then align your communication and decision making accordingly. And there are some CEOs that I'm working with where they're having to align, you know, their comms team are having to every single day update the communications that are going out based on feedback that they're getting through surveys from the people around the business on where they're at emotionally. So they're taking that feedback in and then they're updating their communication strategy accordingly. So it is more work and it is more effort, but it will benefit you in the long term. Um, if you've got people who are down in stage two, which is the support stage, you can see on the slide that I'm showing now on your screen and people, it's not just anger. I mean, so there's a lot of anxiety at the bottom of that um, change curve. What support services are you providing your teams with? We do all of, um, tend to have, you know, the um, support systems in place anyway, but is there anything else that you can put in place? Like, can you get a coach for your teams or can you get some specific one-on-one -on -one support for individuals who are 
who are struggling. That's another thing that I'm experiencing at the moment is a lot of requests to do one-on-one -on -one support for just those individuals who maybe for whatever reason have got less resilience and they're stuck at the bottom of that change curve. Because again, you want to come out of this um, as quickly as possible, but with as, as little, um, with everybody with you, you don't want to leave anybody behind. And I'll repeat the point I made earlier. If you go too quickly and if you don't consider everybody, you might leave some people mentally stuck at the bottom of that change curve. And that's not going to be good for the, the long term future of the organisation that will affect the culture. Um, trust your teams to do the right thing, even if failures occur. So we're now at a moment in time where failure has to become an option. We used to say failure is not an option. It has to now become an option if you want to come out of this change curve um, quickly. And that I've seen a lot of organisations where they've gone down the route of doing tests and trials. And I'll come on to that a bit more in the next slide. But trust your teams to do the right thing like the Starbucks CEO. Empower them. Give them ownership and accountability for how this curve is um, managed and addressed. And then tests and trials are a really great way. Also risk appetite, we'll talk about that in a moment as well, but risk appetite has to shift. So the, the board unfortunately have to get much more involved now than they ever have before in um, you know, really communicating with the organization how their risk appetite is having to bend and adjust accordingly to be able to respond to this. Um, so leading through change, not knowing can be empowering. So I believe that not knowing is a really empowering place to be if you've got the resilience and the emotional intelligence to manage it. My time when I was in audit and risk, I used to lead aud internal audit and risk teams and auditors love to know. And I used to say to my team, but imagine how powerful your questions will be if you don't, if you don't know, if you audit an entirely new area of the business that you know nothing about, because you won't have any judgment going on. You won't have any preconceived ideas going on in your brain. So your questions are going to be much more powerful. So not knowing can be empowering. Not knowing what the future looks like can be exciting. Hard to get excited at the moment, I know, because there is so much stress and uncertainty. But find those little opportunities to turn the uncertainty into something positive. This is part of emotional intelligence, which is called optimism, which we all know about. But some of us are more optimistic than others. But you've got to then balance it with your empathy, because if you go too, too optimistic and people really aren't with you um, on that journey, they're going to think that maybe you lack empathy. So balance your optimism with your empathy, but try and encourage people to ask more questions, get more curious. The more curious you can have people be, the more decision making, active decision making that will go on within your teams and the more ideas that they're going to produce. And then if they produce these ideas quickly, you can then set tests up, which is pretty much what um, Kevin at Starbucks has done. He said, look, try it out at a local level. Let's push the risk down into the local into the local communities and have them manage it because they're the ones that have the most up to date information. And he's saying reality test the situation. He's saying on a day by day basis, reality test it, come up with ideas, ask questions and then test it. It's it's really, really um, powerful way to come out of this change curve more quickly um, than maybe others. I know there are a lot of organizations who are waiting, they're waiting to see, and I'm not really sure what they're waiting to see. Um, if you wait to see, other people will start doing this before you, and they'll be coming out of this change curve faster than you, and they'll be the ones um, taking the opportunity. It does mean that you have to be um, have a little bit more of a risk appetite, but there's so much risk out there at the moment now anyway, it doesn't, it, there's no, it, it has to be about taking more risk. Um, boundaries, so we've spoken about boundaries from a remote working perspective, but I think boundaries around tests and questions and ideas are really important and that links to the risk thing. You can't be taking risks that are going to, you know, damage, even do even more damage to the organisation. So you have to have clear boundaries and that's why board top down and then operational bottom up feedback loops are really really important which then leads me on to e-communication so how can you set up communication um pathways that mean you can get the feedback that you need in the moment to then be able to set the right boundaries around the ideas and the tests to have the best outcome so there are some organizations that have set up some really great online surveys that they're encouraging people to um, take on a daily or weekly basis to get that feedback loop happening so that they can make decisions um, on in a real-time basis based on the feedback they're getting. And then, of course, 
we've spoken about trust. Trust is so important. There's a formula for trust that I am. Um, I do a whole presentation on trust um, sometimes, which might sound a bit long, but it's a it's a really important area for leadership. And um, two of the areas most important in trust is about intimacy. So how can you create that intimacy with your teams? How can you create that human aspect of yourself? Um, working from home and having your kids break into your um, home office while you're halfway through a, a video call is possibly one of the best things that can happen to you. I know it might feel mortifying as it happens, but people want to know that we're all human beings. And this is one, um, this situation is making us more human. It's, you know, I was having a video call with an HR director last week and she had um, a bookcase behind her and it had Lego um, like Lego statues on it and she said oh yeah I'm having to do this call from my son's bedroom because my husband's using the study and she just immediately became more of a human being so trust and and showing yourself a little bit more so that people can can trust you remotely and and believe in what you're saying and then there's the autonomy piece which I know a lot of organizations already have but I'd encourage you to really go for it and really empower people because that'll make them feel safer it'll make them feel less afraid it'll make it'll tap into their courage so you want to lift them from a consciousness level there's a consciousness table that we can move up and down and you want to lift them out of fear and anxiety and into courage and then ultimately after courage they'll start getting ideas and they'll be free thinking and that change curve you'll start to see um, a shift in momentum anything to build mark i think the theme for this session area is for me is it just a different uh, communication styles or um styles of how people process information um mm. we have to be aware of that i mean um I've, many of us maybe on this call have had some sort of a psychometric testing in, in a business environment before uh, whether it be myers briggs or whatever when you understand how different we all are and it might not seem that on the surface on the face of it but how we uh, basically you know, process information is as simple as that and how we react to it how we show that physically or present it verbally and it's really important that we need to understand that a reaction from one person can be very different physically particularly on a, a video conference that it might be at the moment to another person is it really understand do you really get to grips with what that person's thinking um, by face-to-face -face communication you need to have give them other vehicles other ways to communicate to you you really do and i think i've heard a lot of organizations where people are coming onto video conference and they're not putting their video on for whatever reason because not everyone likes it but again i'd really encourage leaders to get to the root cause of that because it's really important that people can see each other because that yeah. is part of the feedback loop and them not having their video on is maybe a, a bit of feedback <laughs> you know it might that might mean something but it's it's really important isn't it that that you get that feedback especially now when people aren't together yeah, I think um, as a business, we would have one of our key ways of uh, of working with customers is face to face. So, OK, we can't do that physically now, but certainly we can with video calls. And so in the last, you know, so far this week, I've probably done three or four meetings with customers um, over on a video link, um, whether that's Teams or Hangouts or whatever. Everyone's got their own business models. But, you know, I think it's just something we've got to get used to doing. And, and I think it feels uncomfortable, I think, for our team. Although they're used yeah. to going to meeting face to face, video conferencing, I think, is really uncomfortable. And I think that's partly as well the environment they're doing it from. We go back to that thought: where are they in their own home? Is it does it feel like a business environment, or does it feel like they're sat on their bed? You know what I mean? And everyone's playing downstairs. It, it's we, we've you've got to understand the environment that people are working in. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got to make it okay. Yeah. So we have a few questions. Um, right. So. Um, and I've worked out how to use the question thing a bit better now, so that's all right. Um, so we've got Nitin has asked, what alternative to coffee breaks, uh, team, uh, um, team meetings, are there in remote working? Well, I've, yeah, great question. And I mean, you can go as conservative or as wacky as you like with this. So I've got one team who are doing um, the Joe Wicks morning workout routine together. And they're all switching their Zoom cameras on and they're all doing a workout together. I mean, that's one of the more extreme examples. But you can actually schedule coffee breaks. So I, because um, I now live in Sydney, but I used to live in London, I actually scheduled, before this all happened, I was having to schedule um, coffee catch-ups with my best friends back home over Zoom anyway. And we were doing it as a social thing and we were doing it, you know, to, to make sure that we stayed connected. So I would encourage you to, to put those moments in your diary. And this, yeah. it goes back to the, it goes back to the whole everyone's remote working and feeling like they're having to cram their diary full of productive zoom meetings have being connected is productive 
So give yourself permission to connect, give yourself permission to have a cup of coffee over Zoom for half an hour with the lady or the man that you used to sit next to. Give your teams permission to do that and make sure it forms at least an hour, if not more, of their day where they're just connecting with people because they will be talking about work and they will um, answer questions that wouldn't have been answered ordinarily from doing that, but they'll also just feel normal and you know connected and like they're part of a team. What do you think? No, I think you said it all. I think that it is about understanding you still need to operate like that. It's still, we're just doing it through a different medium. We've got a few more questions. So um, David has asked, in terms of change, sorry, in terms of the change curve, how would you suggest supporting individuals who are stuck at a low point? Um, so um, I think he's got one person in the team who's stuck on uh, and can drag the rest of the team down rather than he needs to get them moving forward with the rest of the team. Yeah, and this is really important. This is why I've stressed it so many times. If you've just got one person who's stuck, it can impact an entire team. And I've worked with, like I said, teams of 50, 60, where there's one person who can't move on and the whole team's energy is just affected. So first step, obviously the first step is for you to, uh, as your as the manager, to um, have a conversation and see if they'll open up to you. Um, if they won't, I mean, I've had this happen before pre pre COVID-19 with team members who've got stuck for various reasons and I have um, encouraged them to actually get a coach or go and see a counsellor or use the employee um, uh, you know the um, independent helpline just to talk through whatever it is but you must acknowledge with them where you think they are it depends whether they've told you whether they're stuck or whether your observation is that they're stuck as well so if you're observing it but you haven't actually had the conversation without saying to them i think you're stuck because that's full of judgment just um in the most non-judgmental way to make them feel safe just have see see ask them where they're at and see if they agree with with your perspective without telling them that maybe that's your observation so you've initially got to get the reality of the situation on the table. And then if they trust you enough and if they feel safe enough to talk to you, talk to you. But I I would highly recommend if it's a real problem to have give them support in in the, in the form of a coach or one-on-one um, -on -one private independent, somebody that's not from inside the organization um, to support them. Okay, great. Um, the next question, we've got one from Mike. Can you expand on the balance between being positive and on the other hand, being realistic? given that individual employees are affected in different ways and some will will basically be potentially lose their jobs in the future. Yeah, so it's 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 that reality versus um hope, I guess are the two words that I would use. It's a great question. So um and also having the reality pieces having people accept that they may or may not be part of that future that you're painting and having people um, not be afraid of it but just you know the reality is not everyone is going to keep their jobs and I think organizations have to be honest about that because mm -hmm. people know if you're not being honest about something they know they'll talk about it and that will form part of the, the sort of the countercultural dialogue that goes on so be really honest but be really real and just say look we're hopeful about the future we're hopeful that we don't have to you know go down that track however the reality is with the information that we've got today and we're now a reality testing organization there's a risk that that might have to happen and just th this again goes back to that point around in the moment decision making you've got to get people used to the fact that stuff is going to change on a day by day basis and that they have to try and pull themselves back from the future and just deal with the what's what's happening today and i know that's really hard but if you can create a culture of in the moment reality testing you won't get so much fear and anxiety about the future yeah, it's I think it's that, I was going to say, I think it's that word integrity. If you're being yeah. honest, open, as open or, or as honest, certainly, as you can be within reason, people understand their journey. It's the same challenge for everybody. Nobody knows. We've got a few yeah. more questions here. So Lisa's asked, um, a lot of the actions discussed today involve communication calls. How would you suggest we do this effectively to stop meeting fatigue? Uh, meeting fatigue. So you can record videos. Um, I do that. Yeah, so I do that. I'm doing that with my clients at the moment because of the time zone difference. So they're sending me voice notes and I'm then recording a video back as a response um, at a time that's convenient for me or, or recording voice notes to people as well. So on WhatsApp, you can record voice notes. You can send people videos. I would um, and that's just keep it personal. So many people are relying on emails now and I would 
and I understand why because it's quicker and easier but it's not gonna in the long term it's not gonna help becoming even more reliant on on emails so if you can send voice notes if you can make a little video that you can then send out to 10 people in your team with an update on something and then make it fun as well one of my clients showed me this google thing where you can have a wild animal superimposed in your background so i don't know whether people are up for that but that's what he's doing with his team and it's bringing a smile to their faces so <laughs> hopefully we, we know we've got the beach just behind you so don't worry we're, we're... <laughs> That's tomorrow. Um, <laughs> um, Daniel's asked a question: How to how sorry how to manage an existing change program, which which maybe requires significant time and challenges when we now have to deal with the meta level of change to work through uh, in the current environment. Yeah, this is where the boards have got to get involved, isn't it? This is where the reality of the situation has to be communicated. And the executives and the board have to be made aware that, you know, not everything that they wanted before this is now going to be possible. Or if it is possible, it's going to take longer or it's going to cost more. There just has to be real conversations happening. And people, uh, there's a real challenge for individuals who are, um, thank you for the question, Daniel, because this is a real challenge for people because you don't want to let anybody down. You want to fulfill on your commitments. You want to have integrity around what you said you were going to do. But the reality is there's so much other stuff that's just being thrown at people right now. It, you know, the, it's not sustainable. So if your organization is committed to the well-being of its employees and it's committed to coming out of this change curve with people not stuck and with people um, not feeling traumatized by the whole experience or, or burnt out, they need to understand that something has to stop, something has to give or something has to slow down to protect to protect the people. The people have to be the number one priority right now, even just for the next four weeks at least. Um, a slightly different direction, but Subra has asked a good question. How do you manage an existing? Sorry, I beg your pardon, wrong question. I've gone backwards there. Um, just two seconds. All right. Um, how do you think we can motivate people who think this is a, a holiday and, not, um, and are not playing the game? Right, that's a really good question because really good question, especially here where I am. I'm I can see a beach from where I live, and there are lots, there are way more surfers out there now than there were three months ago when it was the summer here. Um, so that you've got the flip side of remote working where people are are not as motivated, and there's that care factor that's gone down. And I think I believe that everybody wants to do a good job, and I don't believe that there are people who are um necessarily intentionally um demotivated i think that's a sign that there's something else going on so if a, there are people that aren't showing up and if there are people that whose care factor has um diminished somewhat you need to get to the root cause of it they might be overly stressed they might be overly concerned um there might be something else going on probably is that's um that's driving that behavior because generally people want to do a good job and they want to enjoy what they're doing and they want to be fulfilled so if they're not showing up in that way, why not? I think you've got to address that. If you've still got the same outputs in somebody's role and expectations, it's not wrong to address those in, in the current situation and, and benchmark. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's what to do with that feedback, feedback and communication. Well, I'm, sorry, I'm aware it's uh, exactly 11 o'clock now. So is there any final comments from yourself? The, my only final comment is please, 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 be aware that whatever happens now and how you lead your teams is going to create the future culture of your teams and your organization. It cannot be avoided that what we're going through now is going to be taken into the future culture of our teams and organizations. So you must be very mindful what you create now. Um, and that's that that change curve. How can you make sure that what people remember and experience now is what you want them to be talking about in 12 months time? Yeah, fantastic. I think that's really true. I mean, my points would be, um, it's as leaders, managers, uh, colleagues, we have to be, have lots of self-awareness. Uh, we need to have empathy to the challenges at this point, but equally at the same time, offer a clear direction. Um, we need to respond to the feedback, to our communication or the lack of communication or the way it's felt. Um, I think that's, it doesn't mean you, you doesn't mean that people are challenging your decisions, but they're challenging their understanding and their reasoning. And, and obviously they're on that change curve. Where are they on that change curve? Think about that. So really it will be tell, show, share, uh, explain to people what good looks like, because it will be different to what it was six weeks ago. Um, and again, it came up, you know, communicating teams. Um, it's not all top down. It's, it's different, different vehicles to pass on and communicate the key challenges and opportunities we have at this point in time. 
So uh, thank you very much for everyone for attending. Really appreciate you uh, joining us this morning. Um, thank you very much to Zoe. Um, we'll send out a follow-up email straight away, and then we will share a, a copy of the webinar, a recording of the webinar in the next day or so. Equally, on the um, follow-up email, I'm going to ask, um, I'm a chair, a vice chair of a charity, and we're looking for donations. If people feel that this be, uh, webinar has been beneficial, um, we're looking for donations towards that charity. So it's not compulsory, but feel free um, to make donations to the Bright Night in Action for Children charity, who, who uh, I'm a chair with. So uh, thank you very much for your time this morning. Have a successful day and keep communicating. I think that's the message. Cheers now. Thank you. Bye.